Good afternoon, everyone. I am Megan Friedman from the Free Market Medical Association. The panel of gentlemen you have in front of you today needs very little introduction, I'm sure. First, we have Dr. Keith Smith from the Surgery Center of Oklahoma and founder of the Free Market Medical Association. And you all know Lee Gross. And then we have Jay Kempton, the president and CEO of the Kempton Group and also co-founder of the Free Market Medical Association. And if you could, did you introduce yourself? Yeah. Oh, okay. I just never heard. <laughs> My voice is not very big. Can you all hear me in the back? Okay. Well, I'm Keith Smith, um, anesthesiologist in private practice um, since 1990 and founded the Surgery Center of Oklahoma with another anesthesiologist, Dr. Steve Lantier. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I won't go too much into the history of our organization because I think many of you in the room are, are very familiar with uh, what we've done. I'll leapfrog to 10 years ago now, and it doesn't seem like it could be 10 years ago. We uh, launched all of, we launched a website that had all of the prices for the procedures that we perform uh, online. And the only changes that we've made since that time is to add procedures and lower prices. So. <clears throat> I, I want to I want to congratulate everyone in here on on this conference. The the size of the conference I understand is double what it was last year, and I believe was is last year was double what it was the year before. At the Free Market Medical Association, which Jay and I uh, have co-founded uh, in an attempt to bring buyers and sellers of medical services together, keeping the number of intermediaries uh, absent or to a minimum, uh, only including those who facilitate that purchase exchange. We've had a similar trajectory. We've doubled uh, every year uh, since we started. This is our uh, fifth year. And our annual conference will be in Dallas uh, this April. You would all be welcome to attend. Uh, Dr. Ron Paul will be our keynote speaker. Um, I, I really was surprised. I asked him and he said yes. He was happy to do it. He's a, he's a big fan of everything everyone in this room is doing. Uh, he's a big fan of yours, uh, Lee, you and Josh. He's very aware. So congratulations on, on the size of the conference. This is, this is very, very impressive. And it's truly a nightmare. Uh, for all of the thugs uh, that are involved in this industry. It really is. Well, it is. Um, uh, the healthcare industry, as any of you know, that uh, uh, you know, got really close to burnout and felt like your back was against the wall. Um, it, 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 this is a real oasis, uh, but, but also know this is a real nightmare for the bad guys in the industry. So congratulations to you all. So I was asked to talk about uh, the dysfunction of hospital care, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of fork off and go two directions. One is, one is a description of the current dysfunction and how it works and how our putting prices online 10 years ago revealed to us um, really how, how the scam uh, and how the cartel works, and I refer I refer to the cartel, when I, mean, when I say that, I'm talking about the big hospital systems colluding with the big insurance companies uh, with Uncle Sam driving the getaway car. So the three, the three goons involved in this cartel are, are thus described. Uh, I also like to say that the only difference between a Mexican drug cartel and the health cartel in this country is the Mexican drug cartel actually does what it says and delivers a product. <laughs> The second part of this is, is the more involved part, uh, and it is the true reason for hospital care dysfunction. And it might surprise many of you for me to say the real reason the hospital care and, and dysfunction in the marketplace is downstream and the result of everyone in this room not owning the hospitals where your patients receive their care. And I see that as part two not terribly far downstream of this movement where everyone in the room takes control of their practice, but
but it's high time we get back to the day when the primary care doctors owned the hospitals where their patients received their care. That is, after all, after how almost every hospital in the United States started. It's a throwback, but at that point, you then are a medical and a financial advocate for your patients. That's, I'm gonna come back to that. So I'll, I'll go through the, the dysfunction and how it works. Uh, as we've discovered by just putting our prices online, and some of you have heard this uh, before, but I, I'll go through this for the benefit of those of you that have not. I like to use the example of the $100 aspirin uh, and its journey through the cesspool of this healthcare system so that you can understand really how this works. So a, a hospital generates a gigantic hospital bill, and, and let's say they bill $100 for an aspirin. Uh, the insurance company rides in and discounts that $100 and pays $5. The hospital claims they lost $95, don't you know? We all know they paid a penny for the aspirin. But the hospital uses this claimed loss of $95 as care for which they were not compensated, and it also justifies the fiction of their not-for-profit status. You think, okay, uh, I'm kind of, this is gross, but it gets worse. Um, <laughs> the insurance company, you think, well, why, how does this work? How is this good for the insurance company? Well, insurance companies, it turns out, make some money by, by collecting premiums and paying claims. And to the extent that the premiums collected are more than the claims paid, they have some profit but there is another source of profit, and it is this discount from $100 to $5 for the aspirin. Let's make this more fun. Let's make it a $100,000 aspirin, which is basically what um, a lot of hospitals charge for a knee replacement that's $15,499 in my facility. So, yeah, $100,000 bill, insurance pays 20,000, hospital, says we lost 80,000, and that justifies the fiction of their not-for-profit status. The hospital then takes that $80,000 loss, throws it into a slop jar, shifts, uh, ships it off to Washington, D.C., where they receive a kickback called this disproportionate share hospital payment or uncompensated care payment. They receive a kickback to the extent that they claim these losses. So it's like a reverse Enron, where Enron bolstered their profits by over-exaggerating earnings. Hospitals make more money by exaggerating their losses. So hospitals claim they lost all this money when it's, it's simply a fictional accounting exercise. And then they get paid by the federal government to the extent that they claim these losses. Now let's get back to the insurance company. The insurance company paid 20000 for this $100,000 bill. Then they ride into the employer group. And this is why it's important. Phil Eskew's uh, talk was fabulous. I don't know if he's in the room. It's important for you guys to understand self-funding. The, the insurance company then rides into the employer group and says, listen, you know, they're on their white horse. We have this $100,000 bill and we discounted it down to 20,000. We saved you. 80,000. Now forget that all this is pre-negotiated between the hospital and the insurance company, but the insurance company then collects a commission from the employer to the extent that these savings were achieved. So if you think through that, you mathematicians in the room, the insurance company would rather have received a $200,000 bill. In fact, hospital administrators they shock some of you that I actually know some and they speak to me, but um, <laughs> hospital administrators have told me it's not uncommon for an insurance carrier to ask the insurance, to ask the hospital to double a charge because that allows them to maximize their profit on this claims repricing exercise. So that, that is how the current dysfunction works. And the reason I know this is when we put our prices online, 
knee arthroscopies, $3,740. Uh, gallbladders, $5,865. All the prices are all inclusive. No insurance carrier wanted to work with us. And it did not make sense. I mean, our facility is known for its quality. It's darn sure known for its price. And so as a value, why would an insurance carrier not want to work with the Surgery Center of Oklahoma or anybody else that posts their prices for that matter? And the reason is they forego this skimming of the claim. They forego this opportunity to sell a discount. So that is, I think, one of the reasons I was invited was to share that part of the answer. More importantly, I believe the reason the system is so dysfunctional, as I said before, is the doctors should own all of the hospitals, all of them. And physician ownership in itself is not anything special. But physician ownership coupled with price transparency and the ownership of the primary care doctors is unbeatable. That is the system that actually was available until the federal government inflicted something called Hill Burton on us, which so these government hospitals metastasized all over the country and they were not satisfied with billing patients. And so they, I believe that's why we wound up with Medicare and Medicaid because these government hospitals wanted to plug directly into the taxpayer trough and not collect from patients. And then it was game on. Prices went through the roof. Uh, patients would come in and say, I've got this horrendous hospital bill to the physician who admitted them to the hospital. And at that point, the physician could say, eh, you know, that's the hospital. I can't really do anything about that. All of that goes away when the physicians own the hospitals. But as, physic as, future, physic as future owners of hospitals, that is how I'm going to wrap this up, because I think everyone in this room will have the opportunity to do that. And also tell people this is the cure for the manpower shortage in rural America. I know physicians in urban areas that would leave and go to a rural area if the opportunity to own the hospital was there. So as an owner of a rural hospital, I think you need to understand uh, self-funding. You need to understand the concept of self-insurance. Self-insurance, um, I hope this doesn't bore you, self-insurance is where an employer tells Blue Cross to take a hike. United, take a hike. We are going to assume the risk and we are going to pay for our employees' care out of operational revenue. I'm self-funded at the Surgery Center of Oklahoma with 43 employees. So this is not just a game for huge, huge companies. So we have 43 employees and we're self-funded and we've saved millions of dollars since making this decision about 16 years ago. So I buy all of the care that the employees at the Surgery Center of Oklahoma receive. But I've given someone else the checkbook because I have a full-time anesthesia practice and I don't have time to write all those checks or evaluate those bills. I happen to give my checkbook to Jay Kempton. Jay Kempton is one of many, although he's awesome, he is one of many third-party administrators that administer these claims. So Jay basically has the Surgery Center of Oklahoma's checkbook and he writes the checks that are, that are authorized for this care. Everyone in here needs to understand this because of the following. Half of all of the medical bills in the United States are paid by Uncle Sam. We live in a socialized healthcare system. Half of it is socialized because the government pays for it. There is no sticker shock. There, and when the government says we actually care how much health care costs, what bunk. They pay hospital-employed doctors double what they pay you guys for the same service. So give me a break. So when, when you think about half of the care being socialized, think about what is the other half? Well, the other half is private. 
Of that other half, 80% is self-funded. 80% of the other half is paid for by self-funded companies. That is the mother load for your DPC practice, and that is also the mother load buyer, the buyer that actually has sticker shock, the one, the one that buys from you that, like for me, Jay's other clients, they don't want to buy a $30,000 hernia when they can buy a $3,000 hernia at my place that I would argue is better. So they have sticker shock and they are looking for value. They're looking for you. So I would encourage you to understand self-funding because that is where a huge uh, potential buyer, and it feels very much like you're dealing with the patient directly, even though the employer is there. And that, that's something I think everyone should understand. Understand though, <laughs> there are some obstacles uh, that you'll encounter as you begin to explore self-funding. Some of you may be very enterprising and entrepreneurial and you think, well, I know the director of human resources at company X down the street that is self-funded. Don't waste your time. Never talk to HR. <laughs> they, they have a language of their own. I don't know anyone that understands it. I don't think they understand it. And remember, HR exists because employers don't want to be in the healthcare business. And they have an entire department to make sure they never have to hear about any of that stuff. HR also has a relationship with a broker or a consultant who probably is on the take from one of the carriers. And they are not going to hear what you have to say. If you want to approach a self-funded company to gather their business, you must be talking to the decision makers in the company. They will then instruct HR about how things are gonna go going forward. I know I'm being very harsh, so you will hear this message. There actually are some HR exceptions to what I've said, but they are very, very unusual. Your default should be, wait, talking to HR is a waste of time. When you're playing golf with the CEO or CFO of some big self-funded company, understand they will look at you as a dog looks at a tick because this industry is disgusting and physicians are not seen as part of the solution. Physicians largely by employers are seen as a part of the problem. So you will encounter an initial reluctance to actually believe what you are saying. But once you show them and convince them that what you have in mind is for real, you will have a loyal friend for life. One of the other points I wanna make is that there are some self-funded employers you do not wanna work with. There are some self-funded employers that are self-funded so that they can, like the most vicious HMO out there, deny care to their employees and pad their bottom line. I don't work with those kind of people. I'm aware of two, and I won't name any names, but there is one employer I know of, a large employer, that viciously denies care to the beneficiaries of the self-funded plan only to very conspicuously and flamboyantly hand out other benefits that the employees have their eye on as a distraction, not knowing, not knowing that this is a, a complete distraction and, and is completely funded with funds derived from the, the denial of care to those employees. It's a very large employer and it's not anyone that I would ever entertain working with. There's another employer that picks uh, certain facilities uh, to, and designates them as the only facility where, say, a spine procedure could be performed. This one employer I know of has told this one hospital, you know, we've designated you and you'll be our, you'll be our spine surgery provider, but only on the condition that half of the patients that meet the criteria for surgery are 
denied. Those are the kind of self-funded employers you do not want to work with. You want to work with self-funded employers where dealing with the patient feels like you really are dealing with the patient. Because after all, a self-funded plan consists of funds that belong, actually belong to the employees. It is under the administration and supervision of an administrator and an employer, but that money actually belongs to the employees. So when you're, if you're dealing with an employee who works for an employer and it doesn't feel like a cash transaction, and it won't feel exactly like a cash transaction, but if it doesn't feel really close and you smell a rat, there may be a rat. There may be a rat because they're out there. One of the reasons I want to encourage everyone in this room in this organization to proceed and to continue to battle, and this is a battle. Somebody in LinkedIn got on to me the other day because I was using war terms of, you know, welcome to the revolution, you know, welcome to the resistance. And anybody in this room that has dealt with a hospital administrator or, or has had your back against the wall or facing burnout, this is a war, and all you've got to do is go to Canada to look what losing the war looks like. I mean, it, it, so it is a war, and I want to encourage all of you to maintain your resolve. One of the most, and I truly believe DPC is the most disruptive part of the free market revolution in this country, and here's why. A hospital-employed primary care doctor, we can all feel sorry for him a little bit, but not much, but a hospital-employed primary care doctor is going to refer his patients to a hospital-employed surgeon, whether he's any good or not. And in the meantime, he's going to try to gin up his RVUs to maintain you know, the, some appearance that having hired him is a good idea by this hospital. So when you see the patient, you are their medical advocate, you're also their financial advocate. And when a patient sees a DPC doctor, someone who's not employed by a hospital, going up the sausage tube of trying to maximize revenue is disrupted and it just doesn't happen. And that is why I believe in this war, the, the tip of the spear is three letters and it's DPC. So thank you all for everything you do. Thanks for having me. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for uh, the great words there uh, about uh, what the, the war that we're all uh, involved in as far as uh, health care and, and trying to take good care of patients. Um, as Keith and I um, founded the Free Market Medical Association, we did have a, uh, a very clear vision and, and really that, uh, you know, we, you all may or may not have, have heard the uh, kind of the, the story behind this, but um, when he and I um, kind of found each other uh, through a neighbor of, of uh, Keith's, which was a client of mine. Um, when we first uh, came together, um, I remember walking into uh, their lavish uh, boardroom, uh, pulled up a folding uh, chair at the folding table, um, and we met. Uh, when we first met, you know, we kind of both had, you know, we're from Oklahoma, and so we kind of had our six shooters, you know, not drawn, but we had our hands on them because I was a TPA. I was a third party administrator, um, like Dr. Smith had uh, made comments about. Um, but I was a third party administrator that uh, he had not really been very familiar with. And it was the idea, it, it was uh, the difference there was that I was an independent third party administrator. And we are a more of a, a rare bird out there. Um, we are not owned by insurance companies. Uh, I do not get any of those lavish PPO skimming uh, kickbacks. Um, I have to rely on um, one source for my revenue, and that is I get paid by, my, by the employer. 100% of my revenue comes from the employer. 
And the only way that that revenue ever goes up is if I get the gumption uh, and, and feel confident enough that I've made that employer's uh, em patients and, and employees very happy, very healthy, and I've done that, hopefully helped them achieve that at a, at a cost uh, point that is fair and reasonable. That was kind of a unicorn um, comment uh, to, to Dr. Smith, and so after we spent a little bit of time together, talked about his vision for healthcare, and you know, I, was, I knew I was standing at, in front of a unicorn. This was the alpha and the omega. There were no more Keith Smiths and Surgery Center of Oklahoma as I was convinced of it. But before we left, we essentially uh, put a deal together with a handshake that if I could do everything that I could to make my employees, uh, the employees uh, of my employers and their families, when they come to Surgery Center of Oklahoma, we were going to do everything we could to make that look, that transaction look, smell, and taste like somebody coming to the front desk of Surgery Center of Oklahoma and putting cash on the counter. That was my commitment um, to Surgery Center of Oklahoma. And again, with, with kind of a handshake, we said, well, that's, that's what we'll do. And if you can make, it, make this look as close to cash as possible, we'll extend these prices. Kind of the rest is history. And so the Free Market Medical Association is really about figuring out how we take that relationship that formed, and I'm not the buyer, I'm a middleman. But how do, I, how do we make the buyer, which are self-funded employers, and sellers, which is every one of you all, uh, facility managers, specialists, et cetera, how do we streamline that transaction to where it can be literally as simple as what originally occurred between Jay Kempton and my small family-owned TPA in Surgery Center of Oklahoma? How do we spread that? So as Dr. Smith was talking about all of the um, TPA, all the self-funded business out there and how you need to um, you know, really look to the self-funded employers. Um, and he mentioned there was a, a big impediment. He, he missed one, which was actually bigger than the one he listed. And, and that is that there are a lot of uh, TPAs that are out there in the marketplace. In fact, the majority, the vast majority, that they don't call themselves TPAs. They call themselves ASOs. It's the same thing. And ASO stands for Administrative Services Only. But if you are Blue Cross, United, Cigna, or Aetna, you don't want to be associated with low life like little old Kempton Group. You would never stoop to be a TPA. <laughs> so they call themselves ASOs. And they are essentially acting as a TPA for a self-funded employer. But instead of being as transparent as possible. I, I, I explained to employers and, and other medical providers that I want to be like a clean, a very, very, not even a, a clear pane of glass between the, the buyer and the seller. I want to be like a screen door. The relationship is really between the, the, the medical professional and uh, the employer and the patient. Um, the ASO carriers, they put a firewall between that buyer and that seller. So much so that when you all encounter a ASO patient, they look just like Blue Cross. They look just like United, just like uh, Aetna, et cetera. Because that relationship, you don't have a relationship with the patient. You don't have a relationship with the employer. That is a Aetna network participant, right? And that's what we see out there. So that's a big distinction. Um, the, the ASO carriers, um, we, I don't look at them as even being part of my industry. Um, they may not look at being part of our industry. We're trying to get out of the way of the folks in this room and trying to get out of the way of facility uh, managers such as Surgery Center of Oklahoma. But that's not, I wanted to kind of set that, um, really what I'm here to talk to you all about is how do employers and direct primary care fit together. Employer-based plans, so self-insured plans. Now, I was here for the morning sessions, and my goodness, those speakers were so uh, so inspirational, and, and I believe everything that uh, the, the speaker said, and I definitely do understand that there are some DPCs here in the audience that don't want to have anything to do with employers. Employers are a third party, just like the government or anything else. Totally get that. 
I was asked to explain this, so if, if you are, don't want to hear this, you, know, you can kind of tune out or go get a cup of coffee or whatever. But I do think that it can be done in a way that is mutually um, uh, rewarding. Uh, first, you know, these are going to be really uh, kind of uh, reviews for, for most of us, but, you know, the benefits of DPC to a employee, direct primary care is, is less out of pocket, less out of pocket costs for the, for the patient. They're not dealing with a big giant deductible that they generally can't afford. They're not dealing with all the restrictions. They're able to get more care at a lower price point. Superior care and management of chronic health conditions. I mean, you all, this is your bread and butter. You all are exceptional at this. Um, patient physician relationship is restored. And then also greater access to care. Um, you all are much more convenient. You're, you pride yourselves on accessibility. And I might want to add at, at this point that I'm not, uh, this is not just a slide here. I, this was a pretty easy one because for the last four years, um, Myself, my wife, and my two kids have had a DPC membership. Um, we are big, big believers personally in DPC and would never, uh, never relinquish it, even though, even when it was coming 100% out of our pocket, which is the, is the purest way. For an employer, what are the benefits to an employer? Well, as Dr. Smith mentioned, it's really breaking the automatic referral funnel to the inefficient hospital systems is probably the number one. Um, you all are, you, you all have the best need, the, the, the best um, uh, wishes of the patient in mind at all times. And if upstreaming them to the big giant palace on the hill is the right way to go clinically, you all will make that call. But if it's not, we know that there's no incentive, there is no, there is no conflict in which you would make at referral unless it was absolutely necessary. In fact, under, under, you know, you all look at things from a holistic perspective that you're going to take care of the patient's health, but you're also going to take care of their wallet whenever possible. And, and that's wonderful. And that, that dovetails right into what an employer wants as well. Lower claims cost when it's appropriate. Improve access to care. Decreases presenteeism. Um, presenteeism is an HR term that um, some of you all may have not heard before, but that is what I call the walking wounded. That would be somebody that is at work because they can't get in to see a doc and they're not thinking about work, they're not working, but they're sitting there just in a daze, uh, in a daze because they really need to probably be home in bed. Uh, and then also happier and healthier employees. That is what the ultimate goal of the employer, I, I don't have, I don't work with any employers like the two that Dr. Smith gave. Uh, I don't know that I've ever worked with one of those employers because I'm, I think I'm a distinct enough flavor that if you're an employer to just deny care to your patients, um, then you, you probably know within the first 10 minutes of speaking with me that we're probably not going to be a good fit. I'm probably not going to be your guy. So my employers are always looking to have happy, healthy employees. That is their bottom line. Um, our employers that we do business with are exceedingly generous. In fact, the reason that they became self-funded, the reason that they uh, allow us to do their claims work, very much like Surgery Center of Oklahoma, is because they were not able to get a level of care and a level of, of, of benefit access for their patients from any of the insurance companies. And they said, we want to build a benefit plan that is better for our employees. Physician benefits, you all already know this. This is not about just DPC though. This is with a DPC in conjunction with uh, working with employer business. And this is things that we have heard from other DPCs. So I'm not uh, injecting my own opinion in this. Uh, we hear patient panel stability. We also hear that uh, individual DPC members um, or independent DPC members that are not part of an employer don't have group health insurance are generally higher utilizers than those that are enrolled through an employer. Uh, improved diversity of individual and employer sponsor sponsored patients creates financial stability. We believe as any good DPC practice believes uh, diversification, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Diversification of your panel is, is important. Some of the other benefits uh, to a DPC practice of working with employers to some extent is faster growth, uh, becoming profitable uh, more quickly, reduced collection issues. Uh, I, I don't know anything about the collection issues that a DPC faces, um, but again, these are from a DPC. Patient panel stability, we've heard that before. Um, Employer-sponsored patients are lower utilizers and reduced collection activities, fewer terminations for non-payment. Those are a few of the benefits. 
But here's the cautionary tale, and, and Dr. Smith mentioned it, um, but I'm going to reiterate. If you are a DPC practice that are, is thinking about potentially working with employers or working with their TPA, choose employers and TPAs carefully. Choose TPAs and employers that will not replace or interfere with your relationship with your patients. As we've talked all through this morning, that's great advice. Be wary of third parties. Um, I was, I actually uh, was on the phone um, with a association executive from one of the trade associations that I belong to in the TPA industry is the uh, uh, Healthcare Administrators Association of America, HCAA. And they called Dr. Smith, actually sent Dr. Smith and I an email last night, so I was following up on that this morning. Called her and said, I'm actually, ironically enough, um, I'm at a DPC conference. I said, well, great, well, DPC is on our mind. I said, wonderful. Um, they were wanting to learn how can the FMMA and the HCAA work better together to educate. And she had said that she had had uh, a couple of DPCs had spoken to their group before. Uh, Lee, I think either you have or you soon will, Scheduled I think, for Las July. Las Vegas in February. Yeah, okay, February. So uh, she had mentioned, I said, great, you know, Lee's right across the hall. And she goes, yeah, we're very interested in DPC. Again, this is an association of TPAs. Um, and, she, and I said, well, you know, I'm here with 300. And I said, you know, um, I shared a little bit about what the topics of conversation were. She said, well, we're real eager to, to start learning more because, you know, uh, our TPAs are really interested in building their DPC network. I said, well, there's a problem right there. That's part of the education process. You're going to have to. And that's why I'm going to Las Vegas. <laughs> you bet. And, and she was stunned. She goes, what do you mean? I said, you need to understand they don't want to be part of your network. They don't want to, that, that in a way that does not intrude on your doctor-patient relationship, then that's going to be a success. Um, don't do that. The, the relation, you don't have a relationship anymore. It's a shotgun wedding, as we call it in Oklahoma. Patients got to have a personal and financial investment in DPC relationship with their health care. Okay, integration um, between DPC and a self-funded plan, kind of the next generation. Um, at the Kempton Group, my company, again, we're a family-owned TPA in Oklahoma City. I have 48, 49 employees, so we're not a, a giant company. We've been doing DPC. We're in our fourth year of DPC. And the way that, that we structured it in I would, what I would say the first generation was we provided a uh, basically a, a sum of money, $75 a month, in a health reimbursement account. And if the employees chose to go out and find their own DPC, we made them aware of all of the DPCs that we were aware of, sent them to uh, dpcfrontier.com and, and invited the DPCs in our local area to come to our office and talk to our employees about, about their, uh, their services. Um, but that was the way, that way it, it, it happened. Since I was paying, um, funds out of a health plan, a health reimbursement account, the IRS has a few strings attached to that. If I'm going to be providing a, a, a pre-tax payment to my employees that is not counted as payroll and taxable, then some of those strings are that we have to be able to document that, uh, that those fees are being paid for care that is defined by the Internal Revenue Code. In generation one of of, of this project, we kind of put it on our employees to provide documentation. Okay, you know, if Jay gets audited, um, please go to your DPC and get a printout of all the care that you provided so I can hopefully stay out of jail. And we're a small enough company that that's what we did. The next generation, though, um, would look a little bit different, and we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, some B DPCs may not want to or be able to work directly with employers. Uh, employers must be able to prove that the plan assets were spent on care and not access. Uh, I know you all have talked about that quite a bit. I'm hoping, just like you all are, that the IRS gets out of our way on that and let physicians be physicians. Um, however, if you are a DPC and you are looking to uh, work with employers, um, employer plans will 
and again, don't shoot the messenger, but eventually that employer is going to want to and need to quantify the value of the DPC membership. There's some great vendors out in the hall that would help, but I do know that that is coming because I've talked to enough employers that they love DPC, but at some point they're gonna say, well, how do I know this is really in my best interest to continue this subsidy? And if they conclude that it's not, I would hope that the patients would remain with DPC and just get the employer out of it. But if you are uh, a DPC practice that wants to attract and maintain those employer relationships, just know that eventually you are going to be asked to assist in quantifying um, the value. The regulations, I'm going to go really fast through these. Um, there, there's two pieces to it, really. Um, the Internal Revenue Code, Section 104 and 105, those are the sections in the code that allow an employer to offer benefits on a tax-free basis. That allows for the payment of these pre-tax benefits. Section 213 is actually the listing of the deductible medical expenses that an employer can cover on a pre-tax basis through their health plan. Again, both of those were written before DPC was even invented. So you're never, you're not going to see DP, we hope that we will see DPC care under one of those sections. But right now what the Internal Revenue uh, Code seems to be, have the best match is uh, like health club memberships, et cetera, are not a permissible expense under 213. Guess what? They have concluded, at least they're, they're coming along because of y'all's efforts and, and some of the folks that have made the trip to, uh, to D.C. and uh, Josh's stint on uh, Hannity. Um, but they're starting to, to come along, but, but they look at DPC, oh, this is like concierge medicine, it's just like a health club. <laughs> That's a joke, but uh, that is where they're at right now. So to make this work, that's the hurdle that we've got to get over. Instead of saying, well, this is a DPC membership or this is a concierge um, uh, physician membership, we have to, from a health plan perspective, we have to look beyond the, the membership and we have to look at, we have to be able to document what's actually being done. Um, there's really three pieces to that. Um, and I will give a, a shout out uh, to a couple of the vendors. These are, this is not an all-inclusive list, and we love competition at the FMMA, so maybe others in the room will get into this business, but right now the two that we feel like have come the furthest to be able to assist in these three areas that I'm going to go through in the next eight minutes uh, are Hint and KPI Ninja. Uh, again, they, they seem to touch the bases, um, so if you are interested, you could uh, certainly talk to those folks uh, or others. First off, um, from, from a, a TPA's perspective, we have to have technology with the DPC or the DPC's vendor uh, to be able to synchronize the plan's eligibility. When I say plan, you just think of the folks that are covered by the, uh, the self-funded benefit plan. We have to be able to synchronize who is, who is on that coverage with um, the DPC um, clinic. And it's kind of like sending the uh, a, a, a listing of the possible universe of patients that could, could uh, sign up at that particular clinic with that particular employer. Employer enrollment, it, it goes up and down as employers hire people or they, can, they, they grow or they contract at their business. So that would be a, a monthly file feed to have uh, the DPC practice know who works at ABC Wholesale uh, on a month in, month out basis. Um, once you know who is, is eligible, um, I believe that the way I've heard it would work, there would be a custom landing page on the DPC clinic's um, sign up portal that if you belong to ABC Wholesale, click here. And that would then bang against that eligibility and make sure that if, you're, if it's Sally Sue, is Sally Sue actually covered by ABC Wholesale for that month? If the answer is yes, then Sally can go ahead and enroll. And then the employer would provide the subsidy back to the DPC clinic for Sally Sue for that month. 
Again, the amount of the subsidy would be up to the employer. I always suggest that don't pay for the whole thing. Sally needs to have a little skin in the game and the DPC clinic needs to have a personal and a financial relationship with Sally. Second would be the technology that allows uh, the sharing of the, actually I just said that, um, but again, allows that monthly eligibility um, uh, synchronization so we know how many uh, subsidies will be paid based on how many of the um, uh, patients for that employer sign up. And then third, and this is the one that I hope you all don't lynch me uh, on the way out, uh, but it would, we would also need technology that allows for the proper benefit substantiation. substantiation. Um, in our world, and this is where you're going to start having that old sinking feeling again, thinking we're dragging you back into the swamp, but um, most uh, TPA claim systems, even the good guys, we have been standardized and homogenized just like you all have when you were uh, in the system. Uh, our claim systems, they speak uh, EDI 837, which is a HIPAA transaction set. I hate it. I wish it was, I wish it didn't exist. I wish that we could intake just a narrative about what the patient uh, did. In fact, I wish we didn't even have to collect this information, but we do right now. Hopefully that'll go away soon. But our systems generally speak EDI 837, which is a claims file. As I understand it, um, KPI Ninja is very adept at taking the information that is provided uh, through the DPC's um, EMR system and converting that into an 837. You don't have to speak 837. In fact, you can just purge that from your brain as soon as they get done talking. You don't need to know about it, but know that uh, there is at least one vendor that can convert that to an 837. It is a claims file, but I don't, we're not looking to pay claims. We're not looking to pay you. I don't want to get I don't want to do business with you, remember? This would send, we would be stripping out or ignoring any of the payment fields. This is simply to be able to document back to the IRS what was the diagnosis and what was done at, at, at the encounter, whether it be telemedicine, um, text, in person, et cetera. Um, that is really the long and the short of it uh, when it comes to that. Um, I hate to be building a mousetrap that I hope just disappears, um, but that is where we're at. Um, we've been very successful, the FMMA has, that we're opening a lot of employers' eyes uh, to this movement, to what you all bring to the table. And we are just know, if you've ever been to a DP, or excuse me, an FMMA conference, that we also, instruct the employers, the consultants, et cetera, on what the medical community doesn't want. What is your nightmare? We're always looking for good guys and good gals to work with as a TPA for our employers. And that's you. But we, want, we don't wanna take what you all are doing here, which is so powerful and so important, and ruin it by layering in a bunch of garbage that is what got you all here in the first place. We're very cognizant of that. And so I hope that I can come back in a year or two and tell you about a whole bunch of other things and say, remember that speech I gave back in late 2018? Isn't it great that all that's gone? But right now it's here. So thank you all very much. So you guys have no idea how much of a unicorn that man really is. Um, you know, Jay, you're not, you don't do work in Florida, right? Pardon? You don't do work in Florida, do you? Are you doing work in Florida now? Florida? Um, no. Okay, no. I didn't think so. No. So, so trying to find an independent TPA that in the state of Florida uh, was an extreme challenge for us and somebody that was actually willing to work directly or, or, or independently without some some cost plus markup and doubling the price of our services and taking their cuts and and inserting themselves in or some some UMR platform 
that truly is an independent processor of claims, it, it is very difficult. Um, but the FMMA is, is finding these people now and, and they're starting to grow their, their uh, connections with, uh, with some of these independent TPAs around the country. So they are getting a little bit easier to find, but still definitely a, a unicorn. So part of what we've done this morning really is to try to sort of gather data as to what is the problem. You know, as physicians, we're, we're, we're designed to explore the problems, to ask questions as to what's wrong with the, with the patient, to gather data, and to form a diagnosis, and then come up with a treatment plan. And that's kind of what we've done this morning, is really analyze what, what the problem is with the system and, and breaking it down. But, you know, the information that, that you know, Jay and, and, and uh, Phil and everybody else has presented this morning has taken me so many years to... to gather this information that uh, even every time I still hear them, I'm learning more uh, each time. It's, it's very complex, and so when I you know, see these questions of how do I do this, how do I do that, uh, this, some of this stuff is extraordinarily complicated, and you're going to have to learn uh, as we go, but just kind of bringing it back to our practice and, and what is possible and what, is the, what are the abilities uh, of you and your practices are able to do to, to change the cost and to bust, not just bend, but bust the cost curve in medicine. So. Uh, most of you m may know that the name of our practice is Epiphany Health, which, of course, Epiphany is a s really silly name for a medical company, but in fact, we had our Epiphany, uh, much probably like many of you had your Epiphany. And, and the Epiphany came actually from an employer. Uh, the employer approached us and said, you know, my insurance premiums keep skyrocketing. Uh, I'm paying an insurance company to pay you, and all my employees see you. Why, why am I hiring an insurance company uh, to pay you? Why don't I just hire you directly to take care of my employees? And that was sort of our, our epiphany moment is why are we using an insurance product to pay for primary care services? And so we started to explore how we might be able to, to work through this and create an insurance-free uh, platform that we could work with this, with this employer. Um, and what we realized as our epiphany was that it was the insurance that was actually driving up the cost of, of the care for our, 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 our patients. And we saw a lot of this. It was the outside factors that everyone sort of explored. You know, it's the hospitals, the administrative costs, it's the pharmacies, uh, the, the markups on the labs and the specialists and, and everything else is really what, what was expensive. But the primary care stuff was cheap. So. What we decided to do at that point in time was we were going to create, and this was in 2010, uh, we were going to create a membership-based primary care uh, program, which of course all of you now know that as, as direct primary care. Uh, at the time, unfortunately, we didn't have a nuts and bolts conference to go to, uh, and there was no great book on Amazon for us to buy, so we had to pay tens of thousands of dollars to lawyers and accountants and, and explore how to do this ourselves and sort of fumble our way through as we learned it. Uh, but what we essentially did was we created a, a comprehensive uh, primary care service. Uh, and we said, well, what does a, a primary care doctor need to do his or her job well? Well, we need access to affordable labs. We need access to affordable limit imaging services. We need access to, to um, affordable physical therapy services. That's just our bread and butter. And so we reached out to our independent mom and pop uh, operations in the area and said, you know, if, if I could, could uh, approach you for, for uh, uh, send you a cash paying patient, what would you accept it for your services? Uh, and you'll see down the line here what our actual costs on these services. But one of the things that you've heard a lot today is we keep talking about the free market, the free market to medicine. We need to return the free market to medicine because, you know, as we all know how the market works in the United States, you've got an LCD television that comes to market and it's wonderful, but boy, is it expensive. But we start making it better, start making it cheaper, start finding better ways to produce it. And before you know it, that, that $1,000 television is a $300 Black Friday special at Walmart. You know, that's the free market in action, competition, choice. Uh, and then we look at healthcare and say, well, we've had competition in healthcare, we've had a free market, and look what happened. This is insane. The prices are skyrocketing. We can't go back to the free market. It didn't work. We have not seen the free market in healthcare. What we've seen is competition in a price-fixed system with, uh, with, you know, uh, with no price transparency. And then you look at this, you know, the EpiPen. You say, you see what happened with this EpiPen? This is 10 cents worth of medication. We put it in a proprietary delivery device. We make the government buy it, and all of a sudden it's $600 a pen. Um, that's the free market in action. That's capitalism destroying health care. Uh, and in fact, no, what that is is that's crony capitalism, somebody lobbying for Congress to purchase, you know, mandatory purchase of a pen. Um, and it, it obscures the actual cost of the delivery. So there is no true competition in a system like that. So 
We talked many times today about why health insurance is so expensive, but if we were to go ahead and take all of healthcare and put healthcare in a box, and we're gonna sell that box as an insurance product, and in that box, we're gonna put our nice affordable primary care. But we are also gonna put in end of life stay, pacemaker surgeries, hip replacements, every expensive uh, imaginable thing, you know, the, the what ifs. We're gonna put that in the box and we have to sell that box at one price and that price is extremely expensive. It actually artificially raises up the cost of access to primary care. But when we split off the primary care from all that other stuff, the, the cost of access to care comes crashing down. Uh, so separating the insurance from the predictable. Um, now the insurance product is affordable, as we saw with, with Chad's, uh, Chad's slides this morning. The primary care is now affordable, uh, using the insurance properly. So this is what I see as the insurance-based primary care. Uh, this is a, a toothbrushing machine, uh, very complicated. Uh, taking something that's extremely simple and making it very complex. That's basically what primary care and the insurance delivery model looks like. But as you all know, the direct primary care strips out all that and makes it just a basic, simple relationship between the doctor and the patient. Uh, and as you've heard many times today, you know, it separates routine care from catastrophic care. Uh, we have a clearly defined package of services that allows catastrophic insurance to truly be true insurance, again, not prepaid medical services. Uh, and it allowed us to offer complete price transparency, which was unseen. So in our program, we bundled in 25 office visits. We, uh, we have transparent pricing on PAP tests, as you can see our prices on that slide there. Uh, and I would add that those prices have not really changed in many years. We'll see that a little bit, a little bit later. Our pricing for this is $60 per month per individual, uh, and 10, $25 per month for the first child and $10 a month for each additional child. After that, we don't charge anything for office visits, no co-pays, no deductibles. Uh, you guys have seen how this all, this all works. Joint injections, EKGs, uh, any procedure that can be done in the office is included at, at no extra charge. Laceration repairs. But you know, what a lot of questions that get asked at a conference like this is how do I start to do something like that? You know, how do I begin to, to find a cash price on these things? Well, quite frankly, you gotta start by just asking. Um, it's amazing what you can accomplish just beginning by asking the question. Um, so we went to our independent labs, or we went to our, our ind independent imaging centers and said, if you, do you own your CAT scanner? Yes. Okay, so is your CT scanner running 24 hours a day? No. Okay, so if it's not, what would you sell me an unused CAT scan for? Um, if I could, you know, send you a cash paying patient, you don't have to deny, or uh, don't get denied services, you don't have to worry about prior authorization, step edits, get cash, you know, what could you sell it for? Uh, and we were seeing massive, massive savings on these things. Uh, we reached out to our independent uh, uh, labs and said, if you didn't have to to build the insurance company, submit the codes, uh, get the codes denied, wait six months, pry it, apply it towards deductibles and chase the patient down, what could you sell your labs for? Because you know, if you ask the lab what the most expensive thing they do, they'll tell you it's labor and collecting their bills. It's not processing the labs. The processing of the labs is the, cheap thing, the cheapest thing they do. So when you strip out the labor, the cost of these things come crashing, come crashing down, traditionally about 95% per discounts. So what we've also done is we've started to build a, a coalition of like-minded specialists in our community. And we'd reach out to our cardiologists and say, we're gonna go ahead and send you patients and we don't want you to cringe when, when we pick up the phone and call you. So we call this our no cringe test. We say, you know, I just want the list of 10 of your most common procedures, 10 of the most common things you do, and just give it to me, put it in writing, uh, and, and our patients agree to pay you in full at the time of service. And so we have developed a list of, of services available for our patients in the entire um, community. And so we now have a, a hospital on board, and I'm, I can thank uh, Dr. Smith for this one. Uh, funny story, so this was about three years ago. We were in Dallas together. You were talking for us down in Dallas, and I get a phone call, um, and it was a, a hospital administrator from a rural critical access hospital about 45 minutes from our office, and he said, Dr. Gross, this is uh, the CEO of the hospital, and, and uh, I know you don't know me, but we've been following your work, and he said, have you ever heard of Dr. Keith Smith, the Surgery Center of Oklahoma, and I happen to be sitting with Keith at lunch, and I said, it's for you. <laughs> Uh, but he wanted to replicate the stuff that was being done in Oklahoma City. And he said, you know what, I think we can do that bundled surgery here. Uh, I think we can do those bundled prices. And this is something uh, that we'd like to offer to you and your patients is that price transparency and, and bundling. So we have a hospital on board. We have two labs, three physical therapists, four imaging centers. I think it's actually higher than that now. 
Uh, we also reached out to the independent, independent pharmacies, and I know uh, a lot of people in this room uh, do dispensing directly uh, to the patients. That is not something that we have done in our office. What we started doing is reaching out to the independent pharmacies and said, hey, if we send our patient to you, will you work on a cost plus basis for us? Uh, so wholesale plus 3%. Uh, and we worked out arrangements for them to get, for them to, to be the pharmacists and uh, working with our patients. Well, it turned out with the good RX pricing that many of you know about, we were getting very similar prices for our patients. So uh, we've actually not used a whole lot of those anymore, but uh, still the prices of the, of the direct wholesale to consumer are still a lot cheaper than what we're doing at the moment. We have optometrists we're working with, we have uh, some dentists that are providing services, and we now have a whole host of, of specialty care that we're, that we're working with. So our pricing, just similar, I think, to, to Chad's prices this morning, about $500 on a, on a nuclear stress test. Our CT scans of the chest are about $200. Uh, carotid, our ultrasound's 120 The colonoscopy is, a, is an interesting thing. Uh, we're also working with this hospital and we're trying to determine the pricing on the colonoscopy and, and they said, well, if it's a diagnostic colonoscopy or it's gonna be $1,000 and if it's a screening colonoscopy, it's gonna be $800. And we're like, well, it's a colonoscopy. Why do we care what we call it? Let's just go ahead and come up with a price and, and, and charge the price. But the neat thing that we were able to do with our colonoscopy is we were able to bundle it with the pathology services. Um, because frankly, it, it doesn't matter what we, what we call the colonoscopy and what char we charge for it. If they get a $3,000 surprise pathology bill on the mail, it doesn't matter. Uh, and so what we were able to do is say, okay, we're gonna go ahead and, and, and bump up that price just a little bit. We're gonna go ahead and include that, that uh, pathology service. The hospital was willing to bundle that pathology in there. So the price is the price. There are no surprise bills, whether they do biopsies, no biopsies. And our price on the colonoscopy, I think, is $1,100. So that is the, the, the price we did before we did the bundle, the bundle and that was a couple of years ago. But we're about $1,100 for the colonoscopy bundled with the pathology. Our chest x-rays are about $20. Uh, so this is an actual hospital bill, and if you guys have seen my talks, you've seen this before. Uh, full disclosure, I'm on the board of this hospital, and they still don't like me traveling around the country showing it. Um, I'm still waiting for them to fix the problem. So I'm still showing it. Okay. So this is an actual bill of a patient that went to the ER for abdominal pain. And I'm going to summarize it in the next bill, but this is just to show that it is, in fact, a real itemized bill. Uh, but we are able to see patients in our office uh, same day. We're able to get stat labs, stat imaging services. Uh, and in fact, you know, since our schedule is designed to see people uh, within a couple hours, oftentimes we see them in our office quicker than they could be seen in the emergency room. Uh, and so a patient comes in, that hospital bill came to about $20,000. Uh, so you guys have seen this before, and you, you know how this game ends. So that $20,000 in hospital bills, what do you think our price on those exact same services would be? Nine dollars, that's good. <laughs> Close. $301.29. So that's CT scans, that's blood work, that's the physician services, that's the chest x-ray, uh, everything out the door. That's, that would be the cost to, to our patients. So this is a fun story. You'll see a lot of these familiar faces here in this room. So, Elena. Hello. Elena George. Uh, Elena is an ear, nose, and, and, and throat uh, surgeon in Atlanta. Uh, she'll be speaking tomorrow. Uh, and she does a lot of work down in Antigua. And she, uh, when she was down there doing some of her work, uh, diagnosed a patient with thyroid cancer. Of course, that patient had no health insurance, and so uh, a thyroid cancer surgery in San Juan, which is about where most of those patients probably would go, uh, would be around about $100,000. So she called up Dr. Smith in Surgery Center of Oklahoma, and, and he said, yeah, we could, we could do that. He said, but the problem with thyroid cancer is patients can need about six months of preoperative and postoperative management. Uh, they're going to need assessments. They're going to need imaging. They may need medications. They're going to need an endocrine consult. Uh, so it's not just a matter of doing surgery. The patient actually needs some medical follow-up. Uh, and he said, you know, uh, Florida is a lot closer to the Caribbean than, uh, uh, than Oklahoma City. And so... Dr. George and Dr. Smith reached out to me and said, you know, would you be willing to co-manage this patient with us? So the uh, patient did uh, come to the United States. Uh, she arranged, she came to us, and she was here for six months. 
Uh, we did the imaging, we did the workup, endocrine consult, all the, the lab work, uh, sent her and coordinated with the surgeons in Oklahoma City. Uh, she flew off to Oklahoma City, had her surgery, came back, did the follow-up with us, blood work, got her on medication, six months. The total for all of that came to about $10,000. Unfortunately, I've not heard of this from this patient since the hurricane, so I hope you have. <laughs> uh, so I told you about what we're doing with this hospital. We're now bundling surgeries. We're, we're bundling uh, uh, knee replacement surgeries. Uh, so typically an uninsured knee replacement uh, in the United States, generally you've got your, of course, your, your charges, but then uh, a lot of these uninsured patients, they could pay forty-five to $60,000. So these people are traveling out of the country. Uh, they're traveling to Singapore. You know, a, a, a surgical trip to Singapore for a knee replacement is about eighteen to twenty-two thousand dollars. So at the hospital we're working with down at the bottom there, our price is eighteen thousand five hundred and fifty dollars. Now that price includes the implant, it includes the surgeon, it includes the anesthesiologist, and it also, in this case, included a week's stay uh, for rehabilitation services. Uh, and so the interesting thing about this phenomenon is that when this patient went to the hospital for this, you know, they came with a check. A uh, patient comes with a check in the hand, and the CEO called us up and said, this is fantastic. Uh, what we did was we went ahead and got the patient Egyptian cotton sheets, and we, we, we got some flowers, and we put some balloons in there, got the room real nice, it's like, and, and we're going to go ahead and set up a catering menu. Uh, we're going to go ahead and have food delivered in. It's going to be really nice, It'll, and we're going to hire a private duty nurse because uh, private duty nurse is the way to go. We brought in our surgeon from out of the community that generally wouldn't operate in this critical access hospital. And I said, well, just out of curiosity, what does Medicare pay you for that? He's like, oh, about the same amount. I'm like, well, what's the difference? He said, Medicare doesn't pay us in advance. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, on the one hand, you know, the patient is treated like royalty. Uh, this was the, the kind of treatment that we would see patients coming to us. When I worked at the Cleveland Clinic, you'd see kings and queens coming in and getting that sort of level of treatment. Uh, but because the patient was the one with the check in the hand, uh, the treatment was completely different. So Chad alluded to this a little bit earlier, the cost of coverage in the United States. Uh, as of last year, uh, th this is an employer-sponsored plan uh, for a family of four. Is a, uh, PPO is about, it's actually now probably closer to $27,000 this year, uh, $25,000, uh, of which the employee's portion of that now is, is over $11,000. Okay. So that's the employee's out-of-pocket uh, between co-payments, uh, uh, deductibles and so forth. And so I already just shared your story. Your once in a lifetime cancer event, we cured for $10,000. So what are we paying so much money for insurance if your once in a lifetime knee replacement, or I should say your twice in a lifetime knee replacement, perhaps worst case scenario is $18,500. Uh, and so if you can cure the, the once in a lifetime event for less than your, your one year out of pocket expense, why are we using insurance to pay for all these things? So since I'm talking about the skyrocketing costs of healthcare, uh, this is the actual cost of our membership since we launched. We have actually lowered our prices. This is healthcare inflation in the DPC world. <laughs> so if we look at the difference between the cost of coverage versus the cost of the care. So in my practice, a direct primary care for a family of four uh, for a year is about $1,800 per year with the membership fees. No copays, no deductibles, you know how that goes. The PPO plan that I showed you for a family of four uh, is about 20, almost $26,000. So the difference between the coverage versus the care is about $24,000 per year. Chad kind of alluded this also to some, in some of his numbers before. Well, those bronze plans now, uh, you're seeing, again, about a $7,000 deductible, deductible. These are ACA plans. This is, these are the plans we're fighting to keep uh, access to is you know, $7,000 out-of-pocket and a $14,000 out-of-pocket for a family. So if instead... It's gone up. Oh, it... Yeah, that... that 7350 So the costs have gone up. So... For this family of four, what I want to do is do a comparison. So Chad showed you that slide, and Jim Parker talked to you about how, how the administration expanded access to these short-term limited duration plans. And so for fun, what we did was we, we compared a short-term limited duration plan plus a DPC membership versus a, the, the Millman index for the PPO uh, over 10 years for this family of four. And what we saw on that red line on the top, that Millman plan is going to cost you about $28,660 
uh, that, that's just for the, that's just the, the premiums. Uh, then you, of course, have your employee contributions, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and across the bottom, that black line, $39,960, is what the DPC plus the, the, the major medical plans are. And what you'll see over 10 years is that green, those green lines is about a quarter of a million dollars in savings for that family for over 10 years. And people say, well, wait a second, people don't have that kind of money to, to, to pay for something major if it happens, because look at that plan has about $10,000 deductible. Who has $10,000 set aside? Well, let's just say that that family is the sickest family on the planet, and they come $10,000 out of pocket every year for 10 years. Take $100,000 off that $241,000. Okay, so now you've only saved them $140,000 by using his insurance. That's the worst case scenario. That's assuming they hit it every year. Well, most people won't do that. So by using insurance better, by using insurance as insurance, you now have the actual ability to save money in years where you don't hit it, but use your insurance as insurance when you do hit it. Um, and the savings for, for a family, the savings for our country, the savings for employers are astronomical. And it's, it's the slide like that that has people beating down his door to get to you guys. Um, I mean, those are real dollars that are coming out of people's pockets. Uh, and so, you know, what does that mean to, uh, I didn't mention it, but this hospital actually, uh, they were so happy with, with uh, how things had gone with our sending uh, surgical patients to them that they actually decided they were going to restructure their benefits program and offer DPC as a benefit to all the hospital employees and their, and their family members. So we now actually have a hospital that's basically a DPC hospital. Um, and it looks like the savings in the first year, because we were able to find a, a tr an independent TPA to work with, um, we're still rolling this out, but we're looking at about a half a million dollars in savings in the first year alone. Uh, and so, you know, you extrapolate that to a community hospital now. So that means a, t a, a ton to a critical access hospital. So now if you open that up and you say, okay, we're gonna go ahead and open that up to the, the school board, the county, the, the city, uh, and the potential savings for this rural critical access community is millions of dollars per year. That means raises for employees, that means new equipment for schools, uh, that means keeping your care local, and you do have a way of revitalizing and keeping care local and saving these critical access hospitals through restructuring these, these employee benefits, letting doctors be doctors again, and restoring uh, health care control back locally. So looking back at the Affordable Care Act, the assumption of the Affordable Care Act, if it had worked perfectly, uh, was that we were going to go ahead and, and insure 32 million people, uh, but the assumption is that we would leave 26 million people uninsured with that, with that program. And the cost on that projection at the time was about $1.8 trillion. So if instead of doing that, what we decided to do is we were going to go, and that's just for the coverage. Uh, as you know, the, the coverage does not necessarily give you care. The coverage gives you maybe an ER visit, um, but, it, it, but it does not actually give you access to anything in particular. And so if instead we went and get, gave a DPC membership or access to a DPC membership to all 58 million uninsured people in the United States, the net tenure savings compared to the Affordable Care Act would be about $1.4 trillion. So now what we have is the basic, basic access to care for every single person in the country uh, that has no insurance. Uh, that $1.46 trillion could go a long way towards social safety nets, whatever you want to do to provide for the patients with the true chronic medical conditions that may hit that $10,000 every single year. But you can, you can use this money in, in so many different ways and, and restructure things in such a way. But what this is saying is that by physicians retaking control of healthcare, by bringing back and restoring the power to you and to the patient, by taking the power away from the insurance companies, you know, they can't do this without us. They need us. So, you know, we are, we are allowing them to, to use our services and, and, to, and to rape and pillage the American economy. And I think we have the ability to take that back. You guys have the power to control this. And I encourage you to use your power wisely. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Does anyone have any questions if you would make your way to one of the microphones? Go ahead. Hello, I'm Shelly Wrench. I am not a physician, but I'm co-founder and COO of a company called Employer Healthcare Savings. What we do is we put primary care clinics into the workplace, on-site clinics. We currently have a multitude of clinics in Ohio. 
um, one in Iowa, and just about an hour ago, one of our sites in, in, in Ohio wants to open up another one in Indiana. I love hearing everything you guys are saying. We're actually saving these employers all these dollars by having those meds as a, a, as a pass through. The biggest gorilla in my room is especially pharmacy and all their non-transparent hubbub that they do. And I love working with you know, independent TBAs like you. I love sitting across the table from these insurance companies and telling them, you know what, we're gonna dictate to you what you're, how you're gonna pay for our plans because these are all self-funded employers. So I really applaud you guys and love what you're doing. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Rebecca Bernard um, in Fort Myers, Florida. Um, thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, I have a patient who was quoted twelve to twenty thousand dollars for a surgery. Um, we went. He has no insurance. We went on to the Oklahoma website, and I put his information in in front of him. Put his email. He was contacted that next day. He is booked for surgery next week. He's going to pay thirty-three hundred dollars. And it's gonna, it's, it, that's going to save him so much, not only he's going to fly from Florida to Oklahoma, stay a few nights, and he said, I'm, I'm going to go to the, there's an, a zoo there. And so he's going to make a little vacation out of it. But how do we handle it for patients who don't have access to fly to Oklahoma? Do you have any recommendations about how we can find similar surgical sites or other self-pay sites closer to home? Yeah, and that that's one function uh, the FMMA serves. Um, if you go to the website, you can, um, you can search for providers by state. Uh, there's a new function on the website called Shop Health where you can enter the desired procedure. I think you can enter your zip code and a, uh, an acceptable travel radius and it will, it will show, show options. And I encourage patients to use our pricing to uh, threaten the price gougers. You know, the, the hospitals have been remarkably open to uh, threats. So when a patient says, <laughs> when a patient says, you know, match this or I'm flying to Oklahoma City and coming back and buying newspaper ads with what I saved to tell about how wonderful it was, then they many times will step up and match the price. And we I'd actually like, had a, we okay. actually had a patient do that from Alaska. Uh, we were quoted 60000 for a ventral hernia repair, which we did for 5200 which included the mesh and everything. And he took a lot of that savings and bought newspaper ads in Anchorage and Fairbanks, and in spite of the fact that his son was on the hospital board and begged him not to do it. <laughs> yeah. And now we have an FMMA member in Alaska. <laughs> Yeah, on the Shop Health tool on the FMMA website is free for any of you to use. You can search by procedure name, uh, CPT code, physician name, area, radius, type of physician or specialist, like you can search DPC, for example. It is completely free to the public. All of our members are encouraged to list their pricing so that everyone can share in their pricing. And if, you're a, and if you are a member Thanks. <laughs> if you're a member of the FMMA, you can post your prices. There's no additional, it's free to members. Uh, and as Megan said, to the general public, folks are looking for care, that is completely free and open access. Uh, again, one of the pillars of the FMMA is price is not a product. And so anybody out there that uh, tries to ticket scalp access to your pricing, we're hoping that uh, the FMMA shop health tool gives them a bad day. And we also now have a Fort Myers chapter of the FMMA, so I'm hoping you can connect with them as well. Go ahead. Uh, so this question is for Jay. So I live in a pretty small town, and there's a lot of um, just really micro businesses that we're talking. Usually, owner with you know four or five employees, and my my practice is quickly filling with these small business um, owners who you know you walk in and you're talking to them. They make the decision. It's great. One of the things that they ask me, and I don't know the answer to, is so, um, you know, when, uh, when Paul was talking about the employee who cut themselves at work, and that employee, instead of deciding to go and file a work comp claim, decided to go and see their direct primary care doctor. Um, is, there, is there any problem with that? Because 
I try to explain that my accessibility is so much better than any provider in my community that will file a worker's compensation claim, and I don't, um, that they're very likely to use me. But I don't want to miss, you know, I don't want to give misinformation about what that looks like. Obviously, the employee has to decide. But I, I just want to get your thoughts, and if I'm in a sticky wicket here and sure. causing problems. I, I am not a worker's comp expert. We don't do workers' comp, um, and I do know that, that workers' comp is state-regulated, so it varies by state, so you'd have to check your, 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 your local state to get the answer. What I can tell you, though, is at least in Oklahoma, uh, our experience is that we see a tremendous amount of our clients where we're doing their major medical health plan, their self-funded health plan, but many of those employers will send uh, the, the folks that have been hurt on the job, they'll say, hey, can we have you know, Surgery Center of Oklahoma do this uh, case and we'll just pay it out of our health plan. And it's their health plan and they do that. And so because it, again, they don't want it to ding their, their work comp experience where they'll end up getting an increase and it's so much, you know, it's usually the same or, or less money, you know, going just paying cash for it and they do. Go ahead. Uh, yes, my question regards marketing directly to the self-funded employers. How do you efficiently target and find so actual self-funded employers to market to? Uh, because at this point, I could pop up with a phone book and just start making calls from the letter A and get all the way through C. But is there some type of resource <laughs> or some type of easy method to filter through what might be someone who is actually a potential versus just any other random business? Uh, resource, yes. Easy, no. Um, there are websites that, if, um, the, the way that you would find the self-funded employers is there is a, a, a federal form that all self-funded plans have to file with federal government and it's public. It's called Form 5500. And in that form that is publicly available, it will let you know whether or not that employer is self-funded or not. Sometimes it'll even say who their TPA is. Um, generally those, um, to, to get those in a, in a format that are, are easily to, to search and things of that nature, you're going to be going through a subscription service that's kind of captured that information. One of them that I'm not sure if it's still available out there, but uh, there's a, an outfit and it's called Judy Diamond. <coughs> and um, that judydiamond.com and that used to always be able to search 5500 records through that but they charged a fee. Um, during my comments um, I had mentioned that the um, uh, Healthcare Administrators Association had reached out. Um, I, I think that's the better way is if we can start to get those independent TPAs and they know who they are to start coming to the FMMA and start getting indoctrinated and hearing what you all are hearing and hear what you all are saying, I think that we can we can we can start making those connections. Where it, again, you, we are we're looking around at TPAs like us. We're look we're wandering around the dark trying to find you all. Right now, you all are wandering around the dark trying to find the employers. That was the vision of the FMMA, and we have gotten. Uh, the, the medical side, the 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 the, uh, the seller side, we've got it coming out our ears. The buyers have always been light, uh, but just let y'all know we are doing everything that we can to try to start making those connections. And that was a great uh, that email last night was a was a great indication that there may be some outreach. And I, and that's one of the things that we we've, we've taken as our uh, philosophy with the Docs for Patient Care Foundation is that you know we're trying to work on all levels to 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 drive this. So we're working on the the, the supply side by by educating physicians on how to do this. We're working on the education on the on the policy side, educating lawmakers as to what they need to do to fix this problem to get out of our way to help improve things to to uh, expedite the the growth of practices like this we're working uh, on educating the employers we're working on educating uh, so I'll be speaking to the healthcare administrators uh, association at their annual conference in, in Las Vegas in in February so educating them what is possible and so we're trying to drive the supply side drive drive, drive the uh, uh, delivery side and you know hopefully we continue to keep uh, uh, educating these people to find each other Thank you. Um, this question is for Jay. Are you working with unions at all yet, or is that another 
Does that have too many complications? No, I, I think union plans would definitely be fair game. Um, we have, there's not a, a tremendous amount of union work in, in Oklahoma. Um, we're a right to work state, but um, I, I do have a handful of clients that do have union, they are union shops that embrace this like anybody else. I don't, I don't know that unions would be any different. In fact, I, I think when they started looking at, once they got the joke that these, this is their nickel and there's a way that they can stretch it further, I think they would be making a beeline to, to I you. think I'm thinking of law enforcement mainly. Um, my husband's law enforcement and their union has backed um, someone who is supporting Medicare for all, <laughs> which makes no sense. So, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> the one thing that union members definitely like, and, and that is that they, you know, they like free and, and they like, you know, low cost. And so, you know, the union plans that we do business with, you know, when we say you can go to Surgery Center of Oklahoma and get your hernia taken care of for zero, they mm -hmm. like the sound of that, and, and they adopt it very quickly and very aggressively. And, and I don't say this necessarily also. from a, from a personal experience, but you know, a lot of times what the unions do is they negotiate these very robust insurance benefits as part of their of, of what they do, and unfortunately, they're doing that at the expense of, of employee wages. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, if you could could provide better care more in an affordable manner that allows them to then transfer those to employee wages as opposed to robust employee insurance benefits i think that the insurance companies would embrace that and we have the, a uh, we have a pension we have a pension problem in kentucky right now too so thanks a lot of the unions are self funded uh, this is another question about the TPAs. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me more about the reporting requirement that you mentioned about diagnoses and what treatments were done and things like that from what, you, what information you need from the DPC providers because the sound of that is a barrier to me to want to pursue that. Yeah, right now, um, you know, the way that we would envision this from a, a regulatory intervention perspective, in other words, if somebody was to come in and audit one of our benefit plans, um, they, you know, they turn the house upside down. I mean, they, they want all of the plan documents, they want everything, and they want to be able to account for every dollar that's spent. And if they see in the plan document, and they, and they would in this situation that, well, this plan provides a $75 a month uh, payment to beneficiaries. Uh, for a direct primary care membership. Mm -hmm. As soon as they see that, they're gonna say, you know what, um, memberships are not a permissible expense. And then we would have to counter, well, it's, it's a membership, but it's actually for care. And they say, oh really? Can you show us the care? And of course, we've already had to have given them a data dump that shows all the hospital care, I mean, essentially all the claims that have been incurred for that particular plan, we would, where we would like to be, at least while we're under the regulatory burden that we're under, we would love it to be able to see, yep, we can see right there, Sally Sue had a telephonic um, um, uh, care session with uh, Dr. Gross, and here's the CPT code on what the procedure that was done, and here's the diagnosis. The, so that could be something as simple for, for us as basically creating a zero dollar claim. I mean, I know that makes people cringe, but we create a zero, zero dollar claim. We have a proprietary code so that you can't compare it to anything that you know, is CPT. So we'll, we call it an e-code in our office, and an e-code is a zero dollar claim that just said patient came here. Now, you know who hates the, the e-codes are the attorneys. Um, because when they, when the patient has a car accident and they say, we want an itemized bill of all the times you've been seen in the office, uh, and we say, January 2nd, zero dollars, January 9th, zero dollars, January 16th, zero dollars, and we give them this itemized list of zero dollar claims, the, the attorneys hate it because they want these big, big bills because they can use those to negotiate settlements and, and so, um, but <laughs> we, do, we, I mean, we do that uh, internally with our EMR, but uh, uh, that would be really all that would be entailed from my side is just clicking uh, an e-code for us and, and but if your send. EMR doesn't do that, then you would still have to do that by hand, basically. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And I hate, I hate that answer. <laughs> okay, we have just a few more minutes. Does anyone else have questions? Well, I wanted to uh, thank Keith uh, for um, 
your website because uh, uh, one of my patients had a nasal polypectomy traveled from East Tennessee out there and uh, saved about $10,000. And the next patient that I had to have a nasal polypectomy, they came down to that price. Oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going to go ahead and take a, a 15 minute break. Um, I want to thank all these guys from Oklahoma City. I'm just sorry to, to preempt you here. Uh, thank these guys from, from coming all the way from Oklahoma City for, uh, for this. Um, is, is Felicia in the house? We're going to go ahead and take a 15-minute break and, uh, and come right back with uh, the founder of Liberty HealthShare.